Good evening from Boston College. I am Tom Childs. I'm professor uh, in the biology department and the Salvador and Michael DeLuca uh, endowed chair. I am also vice provost for research and academic planning at Boston College. I welcome you to the show at six, Boston College and the Common Good. The show at six features friends and members of the BC community discussing a range of issues affecting our world today all revolving around the theme of the common good. Topics include how the BC community is responding to the effects of COVID-19, such as our session tonight, to the enduring challenges of the marginalized, to our own resiliency and solidarity, and to the upbuilding of human dignity throughout the world. The show is based on the central insight of the common good. That is, that the resources that humanity has and needs must be shared equitably. For instance, Today, each of us is called upon to promote the common good by social distancing, by wearing masks, by washing our hands. These practices, like other forms of solidarity, are not only for our own good, but also for the common good of all. Now, please note at 6.45, my co-host and I will begin posing questions to our guests from the audience. Members of the audience can pose a question before 6.40 p.m. via the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And I just wanna reiterate that point. Members of the audience, you can pose a question before 6.40 p.m. using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Please note, we would like you to identify yourself by your name and also your relationship to Boston College. Now, let me introduce my co-host, Professor Danielle Taggy. Professor Tagian is Associate Professor of the Practice. She's faculty member in the Biology Department and Chair of the Faculty Pre-Health Advising Committee. She received her Bachelor of Science degree in Biology with a double major uh, in English from Tufts University and a PhD from the Harvard School of Public Health. Danielle teaches a variety of courses at Boston College, including uh, a course for freshmen called Molecules and Cells, as well as two upper division electives, one cancer biology and the other exercise physiology. Danielle is now going to introduce our three guests. Danielle. Thank you, Tom. Welcome everyone. This evening, we welcome our three distinguished guests to the show. Let me tell you a little bit about each one of them. Dr. Barnes, Kathleen Barnes, is an MD, MPH. She's a family physician and the chief of clinical operations at the Kaiser Permanente Barian Medical Center in Seattle, Washington. Dr. Barnes is a former BC presidential scholar and graduated from the College of Arts and Sciences in 2007. After a year of medical service work through the Los Angeles branch of the Jesuit Volunteers Program, she matriculated at Harvard Medical School, where she earned both her MD as well as her MPH from the Harvard School of Public Health. In addition to practicing medicine, Dr. Barnes oversees the clinical operations of an urban primary care clinic, which serves 17,000 patients. Dr. Barnes is an affiliate researcher to the University of San Francisco Center for Excellence in Primary Care, where her research focuses on innovation in primary care delivery systems. She is notably published in the New England Journal of Medicine on the topic of the future of primary care. Welcome, Dr. Barnes. I should also add, Kat was my student back in the day, back in 2008, so it's very dear to me to have uh, a reconnection with you, Kat. Our second distinguished guest is Dr. Scott Jelinek. He's a pediatric resident physician at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. Dr. Jelinek graduated from Boston College in 2010 with a degree in International Studies and Theology. He was also a Gabelli Presidential Scholar, Vice President of the UGBC Senate, and conducted field research in Kenya and Mozambique on HIV AIDS and economic development. Dr. Jelinek deferred enrollment to medical school and joined Teach for America in Denver, Colorado, where he was a public high school biology teacher for three years and received his Master's of Arts in Education. He then moved to New York City to receive both his MD and MPH from the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, graduating with a distinction in medical education. During medical school, he was a human rights and social justice scholar, a public policy fellow with the New York Academy of Medicine, and completed a year-long fe fellowship in healthcare consulting and leadership with Deloitte 
Consulting in Washington, D.C. Dr. Jelinek is now a second year pediatric resident and heavily involved in research, healthcare, and the well being of LGBTQ children and adolescents. Welcome, Dr. Jelinek. And our third guest, guest is Emily Zona. Emily grew up in Medfield, Massachusetts, and graduated from Boston College in 2019 with a Bachelor of Science in Psychology and a minor in Medical Humanities. During her time at Boston College, Emily was involved in the dance organization of Boston College. Actually, she was president. She was also part of the Samaritan's Crisis Hotline with For Boston and part of the Christensen Behavioral Neuroscience Laboratory. Emily co-led a global public health service trip with BC undergraduates, along with professors Philip Landrigan and Tom Childs to Honduras in the summer of 2018. Since graduating, Emily has been serving full-time with the Jesuit Volunteer Corps in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, as a medical assistant and medication manager at Walker's Point Community Clinic. Walker's Point is a free clinic on Milwaukee's near south side that provides healthcare to the uninsured, refugees, homeless, and those facing barriers, such as language and immigration, immigration status. As an aspiring physician, Emily strives to use her education and experiences to advocate for the underserved and marginalized and provide compassionate care that alleviates human suffering and respects the dignity of every person. Welcome guests, it is an honor to have you here. So we're gonna start the program by asking each one of you an individual question, and then we're gonna open the discussion to have a dialogue between all of you with some common questions. So I'll begin. The first question um, is going to be for Dr. Barnes. Um, Kat, Father, Father Keaton has told us about your medical work in urban underserved health systems, ranging from international locations, including Cape Town, South Africa, when you studied abroad to a free clinic in Los Angeles during your year with Jesuit Volunteer Corps. Can you talk about how these early experiences have prepared you for your work today? Sure, thank you, Danielle, and it's great to see you again as well. Um, so uh, in, I'll tell you a little bit about the two experiences first. So I uh, was on exchange at the University of Cape Town and uh, I worked with the, the university's medical school uh, had created a mobile health clinic that traveled into a township surrounding Cape Town known as Kailicha. And the township, which was quite large, uh, was uh, inhabited by people who were kind of the lowest income in South Africa, um, in the Cape Town region. And in these uh, areas, you know, the ability to access refrigeration, electricity, running water were uh, pretty limited. And the areas, the roads to even reach the areas were pretty, uh, could be very dangerous. So um, uh, when we, when I started with the group, we, they had created the mobile clinic uh, service so that it was um, a way for uh, people to actually access primary care and a lot of HIV care at the time, um, uh, since there was no freestanding clinic uh, in the area. So I, uh, I'll just pause on that and say my other experience was uh, um, being a medical assistant through Jesuit Volunteer Corps in Los Angeles. So just like Emily, this is one of the experiences I look back on as sort of the most important in my healthcare journey, because I sort of did everything uh, that was the scut work of operating a free clinic that served the low income uninsured of LA County. So the, um, how it helps me today is logistical. So we, um, in both situations, you're, uh, delivering healthcare to people who have levels of needs that are, um, you know, it's not just that they need the medicine um, or education. There are so many pieces that the healthcare system is trying to build um, to fill for people who otherwise wouldn't have access. Um, and you're also overcoming changing and pretty dynamic challenges. Uh, I mentioned even, you know, accessing roads to get into Kailicha in, uh, 
at the LA Free Clinic, we'd often go to our patients who uh, were living under the freeway. Um, but it's really, when I think about what those experiences have done for what I do now, leading a um, urban primary care clinic through a pandemic, which is surprisingly where I find myself, is, is that the emotional experience is actually what has uh, prepared me the most. And so just a brief story from uh, one of the nights that I was working in the clinic, I, um, so we would go and we had kind of a rhythm where we would see people and mostly do primary care uh, in Kailicha. So we would see kids for ear infections, um, adults for, you know, bronchitis. Uh, but we would also do a fair amount of HIV care blended in and making sure people had access uh, to the antiretrovirals that they needed. And there was a night when a woman who we had been treating came and was much sicker than she had been. Um, and she was breathing very quickly. And um, she had lost a lot of weight since the last time we'd seen her. And we, the team didn't feel it was safe for her to return back to her home that night. And so the decision was made to actually bring her on board to the van and then drive her to a local hospital. And so she drove with us for the 30 or minute so drive back. And I remember getting back to my study abroad housing and sitting on the floor of the room I was in and feeling totally overwhelmed by the scope of the suffering that I was, that was finally hitting me. You know, HIV in Africa is sort of this big concept. Um, and even in the, the doing of delivering medical care, I, um, I, it had, it just hadn't hit me until that moment. And I remember there was another BC student there with me. So a uh, shout out to Kara Chernaga. If you happen to be on this zoom call, I don't know if you are. Um, but she sat down with me on the floor and we just talked about how, you know, know that we just were, it was so much bigger than us to, uh, try to take on, uh, facing this problem and, and what could we really do? You know, what could our efforts really matter? And I remember in that conversation, um, just the, the, the realization of, um, and I'm going to quote a famous prayer that I feel like everybody at Boston College knows, it's like part of the curriculum, but for me, this is when it became real, which is the uh, Cardinal Dearden uh, poem often attributed to Romero, which is we cannot do everything and there is a sense of liberation in that this allows us to do something and do it very well. And, and I, I feel like that is the piece that has uh, come with me into this moment, which is that I can't fix the pandemic. You know, there is suffering that is beyond the scope of what my clinic can do, but my clinic and the doctors that we host have a role to play. And it's very freeing to uh, be able to not feel like you have to save the world because it, for me, I think it be, then it does become overwhelming, uh, but rather that uh, we have a part to play. And, um, and the last piece about it is just the fact that that happened in conversation with another person is, uh, I think, um, and JVC does a pretty good job of this too. These, this work has to be done in community. You know, you just can't do it alone. So even now in the pandemic, I'm, uh, while we're physically distant, I'm trying to do my best to stay socially connected um, uh, so that we can sustain through this work. We may have lost Danielle. So I'm going to ask the next question that was a very wonderful answer and very beautiful insight into uh, what you have been doing, um, particularly in, in Africa. Uh, Scott, this question is for you. We understand that it's been an intense two weeks in the hospital where you're doing your residency as you're beginning to see children that are becoming very uh, sick from COVID-19 uh, that uh, you probably haven't seen previously. I was wondering if you could take a moment and, and share with us your work today that you're doing in the clinic and, 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 and put it in the context of, of, of the pediatric service and the children that are uh, being impacted by COVID-19. Yeah, thank you again for inviting me to be part of the show. Uh, it's wonderful to see you again, Kat, over uh, Zoom at least. Um, but 
Yeah, it's been, this past few months has been absolutely crazy, especially living uh, in New York City, kind of in the epicenter of the pandemic, at least here in the United States. Um, I'm also working at Mount Sinai Hospital, which has seen thousands of patients uh, who are infected with uh, coronavirus. And so it's been definitely a very surreal experience being uh, not only a citizen of New York City, uh, trying to navigate living as we all are in you know, the stay-at-home orders, but then also having to work in a hospital where almost everyone, all the patients have the same exact illness. Um, it's been quite um, a challenge, I would say, in terms of, you know, not only the medicine of it, but also just being a doctor, a healthcare provider, a friend, um, and someone during this time. Uh, thankfully, as you said, uh, kids have been largely spared from the brunt of uh, COVID-19. Um, we, we're not seeing you know, quite the same ventilator use or the, even the same deaths as we are of the older uh, patients as we are in kids. But about three, four weeks ago, we started seeing this brand new uh, presentation of uh, kids who had COVID maybe a month ago, had very mild symptoms at the time, if any, all of a sudden presenting for emergency rooms with fever, abdominal pain, maybe a rash, some diarrhea, and then very quickly becoming very, very ill and kind of having like a toxic shock like syndrome where they're becoming very hypotensive, their blood pressure would drop and start seeing many of their organs being impacted by this hyper inflammatory response that their body has created to not only fight the infection, but now we're seeing kind of this disastrous, dangerous consequence of this overactive immune system. Um, this is something we've never seen before, and so it's been challenging to see kids who, you know, are, little, are looking fine, you know, are talking with you, eating, great, you know, animal crackers, and then all of a sudden the next minute is unresponsive and not knowing what to do, how to treat them, because we've never seen this before, and really being on the forefront of coming up with protocols with management, trying different drugs, learning from our peers at other institutions. Um, you know, it was every single day I was admitting one of these patients from the emergency room and then taking care of them in our pediatric ICU and trying to learn, okay, what worked yesterday? You know, how can we apply what we learned you know, last week to tomorrow. And it's been really an interesting exercise in being adaptive, being resilient, and also, you know, passing compassion for both ourselves, but our patients. And every day, you know, we're becoming better, we're becoming smarter, and uh, being able to treat these kids better and better every single day. So you're literally writing the playbook as you go. In terms exactly. of patient yeah. management. Wow. Yeah, we just have never seen this before. So it's, you know, one of the first times where, you know, we're trying to glean, you know, using, you know, as with the COVID in general, you know, using medications used for rheumatoid arthritis or for lupus or for cancer and just, you know, throwing things and seeing what works and, you know, every day trying something new. Wow. Great. Thank you, Scott. Um, the next question is for Emily. Um, Emily, in the Walker's Point Community Clinic Mission, the patients you see on a daily basis are living in poverty. In this patient population, the socioeconomic, cultural, and environmental conditions have detrimental health effects. How has COVID-19 impacted the patient population you see at Walker's Point? Yeah, thank you so much, Danielle. Um, I'll just start first by saying that just reiterating that Walker's Point Community Clinic is a free health clinic on Milwaukee's South Side that provides healthcare to the uninsured, primarily of Hispanic heritage and Spanish speaking only, and refugee populations. So during my very short time at Walker's Point, I've interacted with hundreds of patients as a medical assistant and medication manager. Um, so yeah, I guess when thinking about the unique impact of COVID-19 on patient populations I see on a daily basis. I would just first like to say that this virus has only, you know, highlighted existing health disparities among racial and ethnic minorities and that 
socioeconomic factors, you know, further perpetuate this. So um, COVID-19 has absolutely impacted, had unique impacts on our patient population. Uh, I guess what first comes to mind is at the very beginning of when this pandemic hit Milwaukee, um, was the refugee team. So the refugee clinic team printed out thousands of pieces of paper and put together packets in I think dozen, about a dozen different languages, um, really just explaining, you know, what's going on? Um, how can you keep your yourselves safe and your families safe during this time? And they hand delivered uh, these packets to patients' homes before then following up with a phone call uh, to answer any questions that patients might have and, and provide additional support and educational resources. So. I think that's like super important is the communication piece, um, especially given that most of the refugees are do not speak English and do not have access to the technology that provides them with you know easy access to information, especially as this um, situation continues to evolve as quickly as it does. Um, right, it has to be boots on the ground. Basically, you have to reach out to them. They don't. They're, there's not necessarily a technological means to get in touch with everybody. That's incredible. For sure. And, and I would just go on to say further that uh, that technology piece is super important to keep in mind when working with low income populations, especially as, you know, we clinicians recommend, you know, call this hotline um, to be triaged to see if you need to go to the emergency room. And, and many patients have said, you know, I, I pay for phone calls by the minute. Uh, you know, with wait times exceeding two to three hours, this just, the right. system just doesn't work. It's incredible. So what we're going to do now is we're going to pivot a bit and post questions for all of our guests to weigh in on and, and, and get your perspectives and, and, and understand from, uh, from you each. Um, what you're uh, experiencing on the front lines. So my first question is, given that COVID-19 has impacted your lives as caregivers on the front line of the pandemic, uh, would you give us a sense of a typical day, you know, before COVID-19? Um, and, and now, if, as we fast forward to a typical day today, where you're on the front lines uh, dealing with patients um, and, and dealing with the pandemic, in addition to dealing with other um, uh, illnesses and, and emergencies that come your way. I'm really curious how you deal with the emotional stress as we just kind of got a, a good read on from Scott, the emotional stress while at the same time uh, delivering care uh, to your patients. So I'm going to, I think I'll start with Scott again and then we'll open it up. Uh, yeah, so COVID-19, as I kind of alluded to earlier, has greatly impacted at least my day-to-day -day life, as well as the work we're doing in the hospital. A typical day for me would be, um, you know, waking up um, and then taking uh, either the bus or the New York, New York City subway uh, to the hospital, not thinking much about getting onto a crowded train. Um, you know, squeezing in like sardines um, on the train, um, and then be able to, you know, see my patients, really be with them, you know, often sitting on their bed, you know, be holding the babies that I'm taking care of. Um, just, I practice, I feel like a very intimate form of medicine, um, and really kind of being with my patients. And I think that's one thing that's really changed uh, dramatically with COVID-19, is just the physical separation um, from my patients, from my loved ones, from my friends, you know, even getting the simple act of getting to work is, has, you know, presented its own challenge. Um, I just, you know, getting on those crowded trains were no longer a real viable option. Um, and so I guess one benefit was buying a bike and, and biking to the hospital so I can just try to avoid as much exposure as possible because we, you know, with the thousands of people with COVID-19 in New York City, it, I feel like it really is everywhere. Um, and then one of the biggest things that our hospital, as hospitals around the country, has just been completely consumed by patients. Our hospital was overwhelmed 
Um, every single ICU bed, floor bed has, was taken up. We had to convert the lobbies of all of our hospitals into makeshift ICUs. Even the um, Central Park outside of our hospital had to uh, erect like disaster relief field hospitals um, to accommodate the overflow of patients that we had. Um, and so even pediatricians, radiologists, dermatologists were deployed over to the adult COVID units um, and were taking care of adult patients that you know, we were not um, expected or really trained to take care of these patients. Um, and so just really kind of having every day being flexible, being malleable, because you never know what it may present. But then also just being dressed in PPE, um, wearing an N95 mask the entire day is something that I had to get used to, which I'm, which was not something we normally did. And also just not really being able to be with our patients, but either having them be intubated, so not being able to talk to them, to not even wanting to go into their rooms because you want to limit exposure, but also limiting the amount of PPE you're wearing and going through because it's so, so precious that it's just really found like it's, we're, more behind the computer than with the patients. And so I think that's been one of the biggest struggles is remembering, you know, that there's a human being attached to the ventilator. It's not just the settings we're adjusting, but really to remember the patient, you know, the, the mother, the father, the son or daughter that we are taking care of um, is more than just the lab values that we're seeing. Does anybody else have something to add? Kat, what's your experience been the pre and post? Yeah, I, uh, I would say, um, you know, pre very similar in that uh, I practice full spectrum family medicine. So mm -hmm. very used to kind of uh, integrating, seeing patients face to face in my clinic, then delivering babies in the hospital. Um, uh, and you, just not having to think about coming and going and uh, being in those environments, just feeling very comfortable in them to now um, it feeling very uh, just the, the stress levels are high appropriately. You know, people are uh, very careful about who can come in and out of the hospital. Um, you know, at, people are limited to zero to one visitors, depending on the reason that they're there. Personal protective equipment, especially in the, um, uh, you know, more acute settings is difficult to come by and is very carefully guarded. So you're trying to keep your mask safe and reuse it. Um, and then from an operational standpoint in my clinic, it's like every day is a new logistical challenge. So I, when Seattle became uh, kind of the initial focus of attention for COVID in the United States, um, that weekend, uh, from a, f on Sunday, uh, afternoon, I got a call from my boss that just said, you know, we are, uh, going from 90% face-to-face care and 10% virtual to 90% virtual and 10% face-to-face. And we're doing it by Wednesday. Uh, and so it was sort of like, okay, we're doing that by Wednesday. And what is it going to take for us to do that? And I think that the operational challenge is that it that is the it's sort of like the obstacles are that serious but every uh but cycling kind of on repeat so it's how do we conserve our personal protective equipment how do we change our operations um and that was uh you know usually we went from plans are very you know months in the planning and then it takes a while to execute to we've just got to move and uh, make sure that we're changing as fast as we can for the safety of our staff and our patients. I'll let you go, Tom. You're going <laughs> to pull it. But, but I, no, I was just curious what, what Emily, what her perspective has yeah, been like, because I remember when um, Emily w went to uh, went to Milwaukee and and some of the things she was doing, we, we were having a lot of conversations and then everything it didn't stop, but then I knew something had changed significantly. And um, I'm curious to hear, you know, from her perspective at Walker's Clinic, what was it like? What is it like? Yeah, so I guess thinking about what it's like now, um, 
during this pandemic, it looks it looked very different. Uh, we had a staff of about 40 and then within a, a day it, it fell to about five and five to six of us. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. It, so it was all of you just working incredible stressful hours it sounds like Emily because you were picking up all of the uh, tremendous amount of work that you know the social distancing required just five people must have been many long hours yeah and you know also like Kat was saying from an operational standpoint having to adjust you know almost felt like almost every hour in the beginning mm -hmm. um, there were new questions now there's a new algorithm and then running around telling everyone like you know yeah. this has changed uh it was stressful but but ultimately it, it brought us together as a group and and those who were working from home have been at walker's point have been super supportive of the in-clinic staff so it's definitely still a family just from physical right. Okay, I'm going to take the second question for the group. Um, this one's a little bit on the long side, so just take parts that you might want to answer, okay? So we've seen these past three months, the linkage of COVID deaths to several comorbidities, such as type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure and obesity, all of which might be managed to some degree through primary care access, wellness education, and healthy food acquisition. Even independent of the pandemic, these manageable diseases shorten lifespans and diminish the quality of life. What are your thoughts about how the pandemic, having illuminated this problem even further, exacerbating this problem, might have a positive or lasting impact on a few different things? So maybe you can discuss policymaking at the government level, what needs to be changing there, healthcare and wellness education at the community level, sort of like what you were talking about, Emily, in terms of trying to get disseminate information to people, like the refugees you were talking about, and food acquisition at the household level. That's a real tough one. Um, Kat, why don't we start with you? Sure, so um, it is a big question, but what I will say is that I think in this pandemic, um, we are on a wider scale or recognizing the severe limitations of linking health insurance to employment. And uh, while that has been known by some for a long time, especially I think if you're in healthcare, you recognize what a bad idea that is. Uh, it maybe doesn't sound that way if you're not. Uh, but now that 20% of our working adult population is edging towards unemployment, if not already unemployed, um, this is gonna have huge economic consequences on people's ability to access primary care, uh, food, secure housing. Uh, and so my hope is that out of this suffering, there's a, a solidarity in that experience that this is a bad idea to link insurance uh, to your ability to work um, and that there's gonna be more widespread support for you know, a Medicare for all like option um, and that we'll finally have the political will to uh, really do some good thinking about how to do that. that that's, real, that's a really interesting point that you're bringing up and something that um, because of all the chaos, I think is largely being overlooked right now. I really appreciate you bringing that in. How about you, Emily? Do you have something to add? Sure. So just kind of going off of that idea of food insecurity as a long-term problem, as uh, we know food stamps are running at their maximum for those that are able to receive them. However, you know, soon that, I assume that will soon run, run dry. So, you know, thinking about that, and I've seen that firsthand at, at Walker's Point Clinic, at the front desk when patients are, are checking out of their appointments, the front desk staff ask them, you know, are you okay? Like, is there anything else you need? And they're not just talking about medicine, certain medical needs they're saying. At first we were giving patients a list of food pantries by zip code, but then what the staff started to realize was, you know, let's just bring in food to the clinic and casually hand it out to people as they come in. So the staff really came together um, to kind of operate a mini uh, food handout system, mm -hmm. um, which I think just shows how Walker's Point, you know, treats the whole person. They see people, patients as, as beings, you know, outside of their symptoms. 
Wow, it's great. You see the humanitarian in there, you know, people coming out. Um, Scott, how about you? I think if I were to try to find like one silver lining of this like horrific pandemic is a greater awareness of the importance of mental health as well as just wellness in general. So thinking about a lot of uh, employers and people don't have access to like paid sick leave and are forced to go to work even when they're not feeling well, whether it be physically or emotionally. And even in terms of, you know, this pandemic, you know, forcing people to go to work when they're not feeling well, not only spreads the virus, um, but being able to now, I think a growing awareness of the importance themselves, um, you would be, you know, taking, you know, physical health uh, sick days, mental health days, and just understanding the importance that, you know, if you need to have a functional person for whether it be life or for job, the importance of health um, in their own sense of well-being and productivity is very important. But even within healthcare workers, I think a greater sense of awareness is now coming into uh, physician burnout and healthcare providers' own mental health. This has been, you know, extremely tough experience for everyone. And now, at least within my own institution, is there's more conversations around how can we support healthcare providers as we're going through these experiences and just beginning to start the conversation about mental health and wellness, I think is important and hopefully will continue on after um, things die down with the, uh, the pandemic. It's really a, important it, point. It, it's an interesting point. Um, we hear so much about supporting all of our healthcare workers on the front line, but and perhaps I haven't been paying that much attention as much as I should, but Scott, you just mentioned this notion of burnout. Um, and I hadn't thought about it. And, and you know, with the stress that, that you're all undergoing and, and, and trying to iterate each day as you go, is that something all of you are seeing in terms of a, a level of, of, of burnout with healthcare uh, professionals in general? Yeah, I'll say that burnout wasn't, was a big issue beforehand. And then we added a pandemic. Uh, so I, uh, I, I think people have been in um, a mode of rising to the occasion as much as they possibly can, uh, at least in my personal experience with the docs in my clinic, and the stress levels are high. But Scott, I agree with what you said. I think if there's one thing within our uh, profession that is coming out of this that I'm, uh, I'm noticing is that it used to be, you know, you're gonna go to work as a physician as if you're conscious, like it doesn't matter how sick you are, like there's patients to see, your teammates are depending on you. And it was sort of like a sense of betrayal to call out on your colleagues. Um, and that has gone 180 where it's like, you have a sore throat and you came to work today. Like, don't you understand you're part of a team? Like you, like we're counting on you to keep us safe. And, um, and I think that there is more of an openness in that conversation now, just to, not just physical health, but emotional health as well of the pandemic has really given permission for people to say that they're having a hard time uh, and, and allow that to be more a part of the conversation of, okay, how do we, how do we support each other as a team? Wow, wonderful. You know, before we transition to the uh, questions from the audience, I, I want to I want to pose another question to all three of you. And, and this touches on one of the themes of the show at six, and, and that is around up, uh, you know, building, up building actually human dignity around the world. Um, Emily, you know, you and I have had a lot of conversations over the years, and you often say to me that it's important to you as a future physician to deliver medicine in ways that respect the inherent human dignity in each of your patients. Emily, I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit, and then let's pivot to, to Scott and Kat, and I'd like to glean their perspectives on this idea of delivering medicine in, in ways that respect the inherent human dignity in, in, in your patients. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I think a important part of respecting human dignity is seeing each person as unique not as a collection of symptoms, like I was alluding to with the food insecurity uh, issue before, but as a whole person. And I think 
this really includes not assuming that I know what people need, especially as I encounter many individuals with very different social backgrounds and present realities than my own. I think it's important to ask people what they need because oftentimes they know better than I do. Um, so yeah, I see the physician's role as empowering individuals to you know, have an agency over their health and well-being and providing the support and resources to, to do that. So my two cents. Scott. Yeah, for me, I would say my relationships uh, with my patients was the reason why I went into medicine and went into healthcare. Um, I really see medicine as a vocation, as like a calling and kind of answering the question um, that I learned when I was at BC um, of, you know, answering, you know, what brings you joy? What are you good at? And what does the world need from you? And I think for me, um, using medicine as a way to, um, like Emily said, help uh, empower people, um, but also to really help increase visibility. Uh, one of my particular interests is working um, with uh, queer and transgender youth and the importance of really remaining visible and supporting them in their healthcare journey. Um, I, I, I'm an out gay man and that's something that I try to bring with, my, bring with me to clinic and to the hospital every single day and to uh, really you know, seek that out and to really uh, meet the patients where they are and help lift them up and uh, really validate who they are and who they want to become and allow my relationship to build not only with them but with their parents to allow the patients to really kind of come into themselves and to realize um, and help support their full potential. Emily and Scott, I feel like we need to have more Zoom dates together. <laughs> um, the, the last piece, I guess, that I'll add, and I, I think Emily and Scott said it really well, um, but is, is the idea of uh, using my role as a physician as an accompanier through uncertainty, um, mm -hmm. and, and that that uncertainty that we're facing, especially, you know, we it was always present before in the exam room with my patients, but is especially so now in the midst of this pandemic is uh, it, there's a lot of solidarity in that, you know, I can look into the eyes of the person sitting across from me and, and see that we both don't have the answers. Um, and, uh, and even if our lives are very different and what's brought us to the conversation we're having, um, is you know a varied set of experiences uh you know there uh there's a commonness to our humanity and kind of uh what we're facing so um i feel like uh being able to um walk with people through that uncertainty uh and recognize just like emily said that they may make different choices and they may have something to uh you know, teach me about how to face the uncertainty as well. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, why don't we transition now to uh, many questions that we're, we have incoming. We have a lot of questions yeah. coming in. And, and I actually noticed some of the names. I recognize some of the names. So this is going to be a, a, a wonderful uh, phase of the show. Danielle, do you want to begin with the first question? I sure do. So the first question is from Chris Reynolds, 2018 graduate. Hi, Chris. Yes. And um, here's what he says. Thanks for the great discussion. How has your role in advocating for patients changed during the COVID pandemic? Are there some strategies that are more effective in doing so on a systemic level? So advocating for patients on a systemic level. Somebody want to take that one? Sure, I can start, uh, Chris. I, um, I think about how everybody's really interested in virtual medicine right now. There's a lot of enthusiasm about how do we get video visits? How do we get people emailing? And a, a big piece of what my role has been for our clinic where many people don't 
you know, speak or write in English has been like, well, how do we build this equitably? How do we make this um, a system that is going to be a virtual one that works for, you know, all of our patients, for our patients who don't, uh, you know, choose to access us via technology, what are the reasons why that is and what could we do so that they, um, so that they could. Uh, and so I feel like in that, in this time where everybody is acting fast and just trying to come up with solutions, it's important to, you know, from the place I stand to really think about, you know, what, with the things that we're building, how do we keep an equity framework when we are actually like trying to uh, designed for these people who otherwise might be shut out from them. Do you want to take that? Does somebody else want to answer that one? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can answer it quickly. I think for me, something I've noticed in terms of um, advocacy is really the importance of sharing stories and bearing witness. Um, mm -hmm. So the experiences that you're seeing, especially you know, as the country and the world becomes more politically divided, the amount of people that I would see you know, saying that, you know, this is a hoax or this isn't as bad as it, said, as it seems and being able to shed some light onto what the realities that I'm seeing every single day um, working in New York City in crowded hospitals and really trying to relay the level of concern um, that people should be having, like through sharing my own experiences, whether it be on social media or we're talking with friends or being able to post videos. Um, you know, showing the field hospitals outside the outside um, and the lines of people waiting to try to get to the emergency room and to let people know this is real. This is something that you need to be concerned about. And then also being able to advocate, hopefully at a higher level for systemic change, be able to share our stories with lawmakers, with uh, our administrators, and really trying to advocate for our patients, but also for our own safety, advocating that we have rules and regulations that protect healthcare workers and essential workers everywhere, making sure that you know the companies and hospitals have the appropriate amount of protective uh, personal equipment that they need to have, or you know, need to have policies in place to make sure that when this happens again, you know, we will be prepared and being able to use and share your stories is something that I have found to be pretty effective, uh, at least in enacting change. Wow. All right, so uh, our next question is from an incoming freshman. So congrats. Um, this is Sebastian Coda. I think Sebastian has submitted a few questions on some of our previous shows. So uh, welcome to BC, Sebastian. Uh, his question is the following. Um, how are uh, a lot of the issues that impact marginalized communities um, that are now being brought to life with COVID-19? Do, do you believe those issues um, and, and the whole COVID-19 pandemic, do you think it'll drive change and that uh, these issues that are perhaps unique to marginalized communities will be addressed now much and, and more attention and perhaps resources paid to and it to be attentive to these issues. Emily, you're really on the front lines of this. What do you think? I think that we have to have the hope that it will, because um, without that, you know, what do we have? So that's what I would say is we can hope, and like the previous question said, you know, how to advocate for our patients so that that change does happen. That's great. Anybody else want to add to that? We have another one from Father Jim Keenan, Vice Provost for Global Engagement, Director of the Jesuit Institute and the Kinesius Chair in Theology. And his question is, each of you have studied an earlier pandemic that's still with us, HIV and AIDS. Do you see any similarities between the two pandemics? Does anybody want to take that one? All of you have had some experience with HIV AIDS and definitely with COVID-19. I'll uh, Scott, yeah. thank uh, you. No, yeah, thank you, Father Keenan, for your question. I, there are a lot of similarities and, and differences between the two pandemics. I think kind of what we've highlighted earlier is uh, pandemics in general really expose the inequalities and equities that exist within society. And often it's those who are most marginalized who 
are most impacted by the pandemic both immediately, then also after the news cameras have left. Mm -hmm. And I think that's gonna be one of the important things that we need to keep an eye on that, you know, while we're seeing that higher rates of uh, African-American and Latinx um, communities are being impacted by the virus, that hopefully, you know, as the previous question said, we can start to address some of the structural inequalities that are leading to these issues but recognizing that once you know, the news cameras go to the next thing, that we can't forget those inequities still exist and that we need to be fighting every day to make sure that everyone has equitable rights uh, and access to healthcare, whether it be hopefully not to their insurer, but through a single payer system, but that we really are looking out for those who are most marginalized in society uh, and that we're you know, helping support everyone. So we have a question from Andrew Thomas. Uh, is a rising senior, uh, I'm sorry, rising junior at Boston College. Uh, Andrew's question is, um, what is the recovery process like for a patient that is diagnosed with uh, coronavirus? Uh, specifically, how long are they kept in the hospital and how does their, the severity of their symptoms impact their stay? And I would imagine, just to add to that, there might be a difference between adult and pediatric, but I'm wondering, Kat, if you wanna take that question. Sure, I would say that the answer is it really varies. Um, so it's, a, it is, it's, if we even draw on the last question of the similarities between HIV and this pandemic is that we're still at the beginning. And I know that feels hard because it feels like we've also been here forever. Um, but we are just uh, kind of skimming the surface of what we're learning about uh, recovery um, so my uh, kind of lens is more from caring for people who are on the outpatient side uh, and, uh, and our, our knowledge is changing all the time. Uh, Scott, similar to you, I had a woman young in her 20s who had what we thought was a more mild case of the illness, um, uh, but maybe had a, a dry cough that just didn't totally go away for, you know, uh, a month and she was a healthcare worker and she kept saying, can I go back to work? I feel fine. I'm just had this cough. And we kept saying, no, we don't know yet. We're, we're sorry, but we need you to stay home. And then she ended up representing and getting admitted to the ICU, uh, getting much sicker um, uh, about a month after her initial symptoms had worn off. So, and then it just raises lots of questions of, do you get sick again? Or, you know, what, we just don't know. And so, I'd say that uh, we uh, we have algorithms that are kind of the uh, based off of the majority experience, but I um, I'm hesitant to uh, commit to any timelines just because it really does vary. Emily or Scott, do you want to jump in on that one at all? I'm sure you've seen a wide range. Okay, we'll ask another question then. Um, this question is from Mark Sue. As medical professionals, what kinds of supports do you need from the people around you, inside and outside of your work settings? Thanks, Mark. I can take this one real quick. Okay, go for it, Emily. So our Walker's Point Community Clinic staff gets together uh, every other week where everyone on the staff is present. So during that time, everyone in the clinic stops what they're doing and we get on this Zoom call together and each person has the opportunity to speak about how they've been doing. And I think, I think it might've been Scott who was saying this, but the importance of sharing your story mm -hmm. and being listened to by people you care about and um, who care about you, I think is super important. So I'm so I'm just happy to see that, that that support is still translating despite the inability to be there, you know, side by side, face to face. Do you see other levels of support, Scott and Kat, that you wanted to share that you feel are important? Yep, we, we have a similar uh, ballot group that we had uh, before the pandemic started, which is similar, like a, sh uh, a space for clinicians to Kind of debrief the emotional aspects of um, patient cases and we do it on zoom now and it works as well as zoom can work uh, and 
And then uh, I've also, on a personal level, uh, been trying to find ways to, you know, again, uh, socially connect while physically distant. So having, you know, uh, friends visit, but uh, be in an outside space and far away from each other. And, uh, and that, that time feels precious. Yeah, I, I agree with everyone. I think everything that you guys said and also other um, things just like food, um, it's been really great to have um, restaurants in the area have been donating meals to the hospital. Uh, and that's just been like a really wonderful thing. I, you know, I know personally I wouldn't have been able to do nearly all that I've been able to do the past few months without the support of my husband and my friends who've really been there to help support me both physically by feeding me and laundry, um, but also emotionally, you know, after a long, you know, really traumatic day, having someone there you can talk to and just listen has been really wonderful. And um, so thank you to everyone who's donated a meal. Um, one of my BC friends, um, made a mask to send um, that I could wear to the hospital. And so just thank you everyone for all of both the financial and uh, other, you know, emotional support you provided me as well as other healthcare professionals uh, in your lives. I'm glad you mentioned that, Scott, because it reminds you that during this pandemic, there's an outpouring of humanity um, in light of all the chaos and just, um, briefly just the number of hospitals in Boston that could not take the number of volunteers that wanted to volunteer was amazing. So people were trying to do their own grassroots things in their neighborhoods, helping the elderly, making sewing masks, delivering groceries and whatnot. It can, you can see it everywhere. That's, that's the, the heartening part of this. I'll also add one funny thing is that a BC grad who lives in Boston uh, asked me what she could do and I said, just send me any funny memes that come across your way. And uh, she's not given up. I get them regularly and they bring joy to my day. They're just little brief bits of humor that make me feel connected. And it's just another testimony to the community, the alumni community at BC. That's great. Wonderful. So I'm, I'm aware of time. We have a couple of minutes left, actually two minutes left. And, and I'm, I, I just wanna ask our guests you know, is there something you'd like to say in closing? Anything you'd, you'd like the audience to know? Something we haven't covered? Guys are doing all right. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. So uh, I want to thank our guests and my co host, uh, Professor Tegging, for uh, this wonderful show this, this evening. Uh, I do want to alert our audience to uh, next. June 2nd, Tuesday show at 6 p.m. And the topic of that show will be human -centered the Human Centered Engineering Project at Boston College. The show will feature two guests, uh, Sanan Bhattacharya, who's the Associate Vice Provost for Design and Innovation, and Greg Kausher of the Society of Jesus and Dean of the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences. Our host for that show will be uh, Nadia Abouazoun, who is an assistant professor in the Canal School of Nursing, and Mary Rose Fissinger, uh, class of uh, 15. I want to remind everyone that you need to register for each segment if you want to uh, participate uh, in an audience capacity. As you know, the registration is brief, uh, but you do need uh, to register because we have different uh, webinar links for, for each show. So please check out our webpage at BC edu slash show at six. And with that, um, we will close and please be well, stay safe, and good night from Boston College.